Good morning. Good to see you all here this morning. Uh, if you would, let's turn to page 22. Bless his holy name. Stand if you would. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He has done great things. He has done great things. Well, good morning. Uh, I must apologize. I, I meant to bring that special rock and, and show it to you, but somehow that has escaped my memory. But since last time we've met together, I've learned so much about that rock because we've talked about it 97 times. That rock is painted like a lamb. Uh, it weighs just about seven ounces. Um, it, it is not to ever be thrown away, and we are going to keep it for the years to come. So Maybe one day when you're over, Hope will show you that special rock. I was supposed to take her picture today, her holding it, and I was supposed to, she's like, Dad, you could put it on the screens and they could see it. Uh, and I completely forgot. I didn't even see Hope wherever she's at, so I'm sorry, Hope, for forgetting to take your picture. Oh, she's up there. There she is, yeah. <laughs> so we just got a couple announcements. I want us, you guys have a meeting today at 3 p.m. Uh, next door in the Sparks Room. Uh, there's a little note on there on the back of your bulletin from Dr. Dan. We still have the August Mission Project going where we are giving out school supplies. And we did have the honor of hosting the uh, back to school luncheon. And so we were able to serve the teachers both at the elementary and the high school. And so that is always our pleasure. Um, I, I know they enjoyed it. The food was great. The fellowship was great. So thank you guys who, who gave your time and your money just to make sure that was able to take place. Uh, we do kick off the uh, youth and we've, we've been meeting as youth, but we're, we're going to officially kick back off as, as school starts and for the children's department. So this Wednesday at seven o'clock, we'll have a barbecue. Uh, we'll hang out, ha have some fellowship and have some games. Uh, if you have any questions, just see me or, or Miss Beth after church about that. Other than that, I, I don't think I'm forgetting anything. Uh, so we will just uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you that we are uh, blessed uh, and able to meet together. Uh, Lord, we ask as, as we're kicking off the, the youth and the children's that you would be moving in those, Lord, that our, our purpose wouldn't just be to have fun and to hang out, Lord, but our purpose would be to tell people about your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray that we do it in an effective way, but more than that, Lord, we pray that you bless it, Lord, that you would draw the kids and the students to you, Lord, and that we would see salvations throughout this year through it, Lord, that we would see spiritual growth 
in our ministries, uh, Lord, and that we would bring glory to you in everything that we do. Lord, we ask as, as we go through the service that you bless the worship, Lord, that we would truly honor you with our words, Lord, and that our words would just be a meditation of our heart, Lord, and we'd truly be focused on you. And as Brother Matt delivers the message, that we would hear uh, the words that you've laid on his heart, Lord, that we'd look more like your son from what he has to say. Um, and we just thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name we ask these things. Amen. As we continue, page 61. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us thine we are. We are thine, do thou be free. sin defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with Thy love our beings fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us love the still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Up the page over, page 66. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials sore. Trusting in my Father's one bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure, gives his day. Best lovingly is part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord Himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares He fain would bear me. Solar and power, in the collection of this cloud and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As I day 
this thy strength shall be in measure, this the pledge to be made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust the promises, O Lord, that I lose not face with consolation, offered holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting ever take as from the Father's hand. One by one the days of moments fleeting till I reach the promised land. Last hymn, turn to page 135. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not for good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. You know, I uh, kind of sometimes, you know, you're going to do special music. No, I don't even know what, if I'm capable of special music or not. But, it, but you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to pick out the song. But uh, when, you, when you can't, I uh, don't know what to do. I guess we're just going to praise Jesus, huh? So, uh,
Well, it's time for our boys and girls who'd like to attend junior worship to make their way over here to this door beside the organ to meet your teachers. And I invite the rest of you to take your Bibles and be opening them to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3. It's here we find one of the most remarkable uh, interviews of Jesus, one of the greatest encounters of uh, Jesus while he was here on this earth. And it's with a man named Nicodemus. And we know some things about Nicodemus from our text. For one thing, we know that he was a, a very conservative religious man. Uh, he was very, very concerned about keeping the law of God and every bit of it. We know that because we're told he was a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were, were absolutely intent on keeping the word of God. And they were so intent upon that that if the law said you shouldn't work on the Sabbath, they would make up rules to make sure they didn't work on the Sabbath. Uh, they made up rules about how far they could walk, what they could pick up, the kind of knots they could tie. It had to be something they could untie with one hand. Uh, they added all these rules to make sure they were keeping the law. Sometimes, well, in fact, many times, Jesus rebuked them for that because they began to trust in their own self-righteousness rather than trusting in God. Uh, but, but from that, we know because he was a Pharisee, he was very intent on keeping the law of God, very conservative religiously. We know that also we are told that he was a ruler. And as a ruler, that means he was probably a member of the Sanhedrin, which was a group of 71 men in, in Israel who uh, ruled over Jewish affairs. This was the day of the Roman Empire. The Romans were in charge. But in Jewish affairs, uh, this group of 71 men uh, ruled together. Uh, Sanhedrin, the word Sanhedrin, comes from two words that are put together, soon and hedra. Soon means together with, and hedra means seat. So they would sit together in judgment, or they would work together in, in making rules. Uh, much like, uh, in fact, the same word is used for the Roman Senate, also of similar bodies in Carthage and Sparta. It was this idea of a, of a legislature in a sense, but ruling together, the Sanhedrin. So we know he was very religious, conserv uh, very conservative religiously. We know that he was a ruler. Some suggest that Nicodemus, we know he was wealthy, because later on we'll find when Jesus is crucified, Nicodemus brings a hundred pound mixture of myrrh and aloe, which would have been very expensive. So Nicodemus was very wealthy. And that leads some to believe that this Nicodemus is the same as Nicodemus ben Gorion, who uh, we know from history was a brother of Josephus, the, the famous Jewish historian. And we know of that Nicodemus ben Gorion that he was one of the three wealthiest men in all of Jerusalem, fabulously wealthy. But we also read of that same Nicodemus ben Gorion that he was reduced to utter poverty eventually, and so much so that his daughter was reduced to looking for kernels of barley in the hooves of horses. And if that's the case, probably that's because Nicodemus put his trust in Christ and the persecution that ensued in later years uh, that caused that. But if that is the case, if, that, if Nicodemus did lose everything, I want to know you, he's mighty rich in heaven today. Uh, but regardless, at the time that Nicodemus is meeting with Jesus, he is a very conservative religious uh, man, very, uh, he's a ruler of the Jews, and he is uh, very wealthy as he meets with him. Well, let's look at it. Nicodemus, uh, excuse me, John chapter 3, verse 1, Nicodemus meets with Jesus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Now, we know some other things about Nicodemus. We know that he was open-minded. Many of the Pharisees wrote Jesus off. They just, he was enemy number one. Uh, Nicodemus at least said, I'm going to listen to him. I I'm going to have a conversation with him. I want to find out from him what he believes and who he is. And so he was open-minded, and we commend him for that. Not only that, he was sincere. Jesus, we don't find Jesus condemning him for hypocrisy, as Jesus often did with the, with the Pharisees. Again, the Pharisees trusting in their own self-righteousness, they had it all figured out. We don't find Jesus in any way, in that sense, uh, rebuking Nicodemus. So he was open-minded, he was sincere, he was also courageous. Now verse 2 says he came to, came to Jesus by night. Now he came to Jesus by night under cover of darkness because he was a ruler. Everyone knew who Nicodemus was. He couldn't have just anonymously met with Jesus. If he had met with Jesus openly, everybody in town would have been talking about it. And Nicodemus, he wants to, to meet without that. So even if he's meeting for fear of the Jews, he's, he's meeting under cover of darkness. You say, wait a minute, he's afraid, he's meeting in the dark, and yet you say he's courageous. Well, I will tell you this. I, I admire a man who, who, who can just get up and do anything, anytime, anywhere, and not be afraid, and, just, and whose knees never knock. I, I admire that kind of courage. 
But you know what else I admire? The man whose knees are knocking and he still does what he needs to do anyway. I admire people who can get up in front of folks and, and speak or sing and, and just on a moment's notice they've got no problem doing that. I admire that, but I'm going to tell you what I also admire is that person who, who God's given them a gift and a talent to sing or to share and they'll be up here behind, the, behind this pulpit or one like this and their knees are just a knocking, but they're singing anyway. Why do they do it? Because they're, they're willing to say, I'm going to use my gift, my talent for the Lord, even when I'm afraid. Uh, I think there's a special courage in that. Nicodemus didn't let this stop him. Even though there was a, uh, perhaps a fear, a concern, he is going to meet with Jesus. And I'll tell you something else about him. He's spiritually thirsty. Here's a man who's very, very active religiously. Uh, he is one of the religious leaders in his community. This is the man who's in the, in the synagogue every time the doors are open. He's at the temple at the times of prayer. He's keeping all the rules, the laws, religiously. And yet he's still empty. He's missing something. And he's looking to Jesus saying, what, what is it that I'm missing here? And the good news is he's gone to Jesus, who is the answer to what he needs. Uh, now he comes with a compliment. Verse 2 again says, the same came to Jesus by night. He said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. For no man can do the miracles you do except God is with him. So he says, you're a teacher come from God. We recognize this. He meant that as a compliment, but that was very false, right? Jesus was not a teacher come from God. Jesus was God who had come to teach. Uh, he was God of very God. And yet Jesus doesn't worry about the niceties. He doesn't uh, say, oh, well, thank you very much. That's kind of you to say. Or, uh, none of that. Jesus gets right to the point of what Nicodemus needs. And what ne Nicodemus needs is to be born again. Look at verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again, or you're not going to see the kingdom of God. You're headed to hell. You're not going to make it to heaven unless you're born again. Now, he's talking to one of the most cultured, refined, decent religious men of his day. And he still says, Nicodemus, you're headed to hell. You need to be born again. That ought to be a warning for all of us, right? It's not just about, well, he goes to church and he's involved and he's at Sunday school and he comes to prayer meeting or he he's, he's lives a good life and he's an honest, honorable man. Look, you can do all of those things and still split hell wide open. God's speaking to Nicodemus, a, a, a wonderful man, and saying, you need to be born again. It's the only way. So what is this born again? What does that mean? Well, there's a term we use called regeneration, which means being made new. Now there's revelation, reformation, and regeneration. Revelation is when you hear the truth. It's been revealed to you. Reformation is when you, you try to reform what you're doing, to change your actions, your behaviors, to, to, to conform to what God would want. But here's the problem. Revelation and reformation are not enough. Because reformation, all reformation does is it tries to change the outward actions. It's kind of like putting a, a, a new suit of clothes on an old man. Regeneration is like putting a new man in the old suit. It changes it. What Reformation does is it's whitewashing the outside. It's trying to cover up and whitewash on the outside. Regeneration just washes white on the inside. What happens is rather than trying to work from the outside to, to be good enough to please God that our hearts would be right, God says, no, it's the other way. You have to be regenerated, made new in your heart. And when God takes the old heart and, and casts it aside and makes us a new heart, he makes us a new being. The old man passes away. All things become new. When the inside becomes new and we have a new heart, then our actions proceed out of that heart. So we're clean from the inside out. Unlike the Pharisees that, that Nicodemus was around who were like whitewashed tombs. They were painted tombs. On the outside, they looked pretty. On the inside, full of dead men's bones. And oh, how Jesus rebuked that. We have to, it's being made new on the inside, being regenerated, being born again. John Wesley was once preaching a series of sermons, and he preached the first night. He said, my topic tonight is, you must be born again. The second night, he said, my topic this evening is, you must be born again. The third night, he came back, and again, he announced his topic was, you must be born again. Afterwards, somebody asked him, they said, why do you keep preaching on, you must be born again? And John Wesley said, well, because you must be born again. It is the initial essential. It is, it is absolutely essential to be born again. Now, you're already in chapter 3. If you'll turn for a moment back to chapter 1, just a couple of pages, back to chapter 1, verse 11, we read a little more about this, this spiritual birth that's being born again. John 1, 11 says, He came unto his own, 
Jesus did, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, here's this, again, this idea of being born, spiritually born, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He said they're born not of blood. This birth is not of blood. It's not something that we inherit from our parents. You say, well, my daddy was a preacher, or my granddaddy was a preacher. Well, I say, for salvation, that means nothing, right? We're all descendants of Noah, right? And Noah was, as 2 Peter 2, 5 tells us, that great preacher of righteousness, and we're all descended from him. That doesn't mean we're all saved. It's not something that we inherit by blood from our parents. It doesn't matter if you can trace your roots to, uh, to Father Abraham or Noah or anyone else. It's not of blood, nor is it of the will of the flesh. It's not something that we can do with our physical self to say, I'm going to do lots of good works and good things, and I'll work my way to heaven. I'll be good enough by the works of my flesh. No, he says it's not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor is it of the will of man. In other words, you say, well, that sounds all well and good, Pastor, that, you know, Jesus is the way, but that's your way. I'll, I'll get to heaven my way. No, you won't. No, you won't. Because you don't get to choose the way, and I don't get to choose the way. It's not of the will of man, but of the will of God. And God says there's only one way, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. And Jesus himself said, you are not even going to see the kingdom of God unless you are born again that spiritual new birth so why is this new birth they said why does it matter that we're born again that we're regenerated that we're made new why why does that matter it has to do with the nature of heaven and what heaven is I mean, we're never going to get into heaven until we get heaven into us there's got to be something that changes in us for instance that fish don't live in this in the air birds don't live in the ocean why it's against their nature right well, you try to take, a, take an unregenerate person, someone's not been regenerated, and put them into heaven, they're not going to fit. They don't belong. It's, it's, it's kind of like you're never going to see a pig teaching astronomy. You're never going to see a cow building a house. It doesn't happen. It's against their nature. You're never going to see a little caterpillar. You're never going to see that caterpillar uh, travel 100 miles. You're never going to see that caterpillar flying through the air. But what can happen is that caterpillar can hole itself up in that little cocoon, and it can become regenerated and made new. And when that cocoon opens up, it's a butterfly, and that butterfly can travel 100 miles. That butterfly can travel 1,000 miles. It can travel 1,500 miles, 2,000 miles. Some of those monarch butterflies travel as much as 2,800 miles, making their way down to those, those monarch butterfly sanctuaries down in Mexico. That little caterpillar could never have done that. That little caterpillar working on its own could have, I mean, try as it might, it could have, inch by inch it could have worked its way and try with all of its might and it never would have made it one block but as a butterfly having been made new that butterfly can fly through the air and that butterfly can travel thousands of miles that's what God does to us he he makes us something that we're not before he he regenerates us and makes us into a new person that's why he says you must be born again it, it, it's a mystery it's confusing to Nicodemus as it boggles our mind too but verse 4 says Nicodemus said to him how can a man be born when he is old can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born so he said okay he's struggling with this idea of spiritual rebirth and so Jesus explains it to him he gives him two illustrations he's going to compare it with physical birth and then he's going to compare it with spiritual birth first of all he mentions physical birth verse 5 it says Jesus answered verily verily I say unto you except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So there's the, the physical birth and a spiritual birth. Now, just like in a physical birth, birth brings life where there was none. When, when, when conception takes place and a new life begins, it's life that wasn't there before that now begins. When, God, when we're born again, there's a spiritual life that wasn't there before that God uh, puts into us. It's something that involves two parents just like physical birth it take, requires two parents the truth is spiritual rebirth takes two what happens is when the it's when the seed of the word of God impregnates our heart that's what takes place in fact we read this first Peter 1 23 we are born again how are we born again not of corruptible seed not of physical seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever it's the Word of God that gets into our hearts. So the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and produces 
a child of God, that spiritual rebirth. So when the word of God is preached and, and some, some, uh, some man, some woman, some young person gets that down in their heart and begins to become convicted and the Holy Spirit of God is working using the, the seed of the word of God in that heart, that's when new life takes place. So it gives new life. It, it takes the, the seed of the word of God implanted in a human heart. It, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we know we're saved by grace through faith. That faith comes through the word of God. But here's another thing. We're only born once. You're only born one time. When you were born, they marked it on the calendar. They put it on a birth certificate, probably. And every year when that date rolls around, you say, on this date, in such and such a year, I was born. And your birthday doesn't change from year to year, does it? One time. The same is true for our spiritual birth. God doesn't have to, have to rebirth us spiritually over and over again. Spirit, he gives us that spiritual birth. And I would say this, too, and remind you that physical birth involves pain. Our spiritual birth also involved pain. It involved the pain of our Lord Jesus Christ who died upon the cross. And, and we'll take time to reflect and remember on that this morning at the Lord's Supper. So he gives the, he get, kind of compares it to physical birth, but then he also says, look, but, but there's a spiritual birth. And he refers to it as the wind. And it's interesting that the wind, we, the spirit and the wind is kind of a play on words. You remember when the Holy Spirit came and acts, how did it come? There's a mighty rushing wind that fills the place when the Holy Spirit comes. In the Old, Test Old Testament Hebrew, we find the word ruach. Wind, spirit, and breath are all the same word, ruach. Same thing. And so there's kind of a play on that. So look at that. He compares it to the, to the wind. Look at verse 7. He says, Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, or wherever it wants, and you hear, and the, you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You can't see the wind. But you can see the results of the wind. You can see what the wind's doing. You can see what the wind's blowing. Same is true. You can't just look at a person and say, oh, there it is. I, I see the, the Spirit of God in them. But you can see the results, right? You can see a changed life. You, you can see something different about that person. Now, verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Now, he's not say, this is not incredulous like, this isn't true. This can't be true. How can this be? No, what he's saying is, how can this be? How can I make this happen for me? I want this rebirth. I want to be this way. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Are you a master or a teacher of Israel, and you know not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto you. Again, it's that verily, verily. He keeps saying this over and over to Nicodemus, which means truly, truly, which means listen up. What I'm about to tell you is important. Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. I've told you earthly things, and you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Jesus' favorite term for himself when he was on this earth was the Son of Man. And here the Son of Man has come down from heaven to give his life as, as payment, as ransom for our sins. And then verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He gives an example from the Old Testament. It's from Numbers chapter 21. You remember the story that the Israelites, like they had so many times, were grumbling and complaining, and uh, God sends serpents into the camp, and they begin to bite the people, and the people begin to die of this poison. And the people repent and ask for God's forgiveness and ask for his mercy, and Moses uh, pleads with God yet again uh, to have mercy on the people. And God tells Moses, take a bronze serpent, take that brazen serpent, put it on a pole, put it up in the middle of the camp, and anyone who will go out and look to that bronze serpent will be healed. So the person who will say, I believe that's true. I'll get out there and look at that thing, and it'll heal me. It sounded crazy to them, but if, if God said it, we'll do it. Others might have said, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm sick. I'm too sick to crawl out of this bed and crawl over there and look at that. I'm not doing it. And they stayed right there in their bed, bed and they died. So... Jesus gives a parallel. He says, just like this, this serpent, was, this bronze serpent was lifted up on a pole so that all could see, and if they looked to that serpent, they would be healed. Even so must the Son of Man, that Jesus would have to be lifted up as Jesus was lifted up on the cross, and any who would turn and look to Jesus and to the cross could be healed spiritually. The Son of Man must be lifted up. So Jesus had to do something in order for us to be saved. Because there was only one way. There was only one way for the payment of sin to be settled. We can't pay for our own sins. Jesus had to pay it for us. 
And so Jesus had, did you see that in verse 14? Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Was Jesus lifted up? Did he die upon the cross? So Jesus has done what he has to do. Now it's important for us to do what we have to do, our part of it. Back in verse 7, there's something we must do. Verse 7 says, you must be born again. So what do we have to do? Well, it's not work. It, it's not, we, we think of doing an action, but rather it's faith. We come to verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's faith. Putting our faith in Jesus to believe in him so that we not perish and have everlasting life. And then we come to that, that wonderful nugget of scripture, uh, John 3, 16. As Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's all about the love of God and what he's done for us. For God so loved. Oh, the love of God is greater far than pen or tongue could ever tell. It reaches higher than the far, from the farthest star, and it reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair, Adam and Eve and their descendants, mankind, the guilty pair bowed down with care. He, he gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. You know that great old Jewish poem that was added into that, that hymn. It, it says, could we with ink the oceans fill, and were the sky of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write uh, the love of God above, would drain those oceans dry, nor could this, the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. The love of God, this, the, men, the men and angels song. Oh, the love of God. And who loved? It's God's love, right? For God so loved. Who is God? Theos. He is the one who was and is and is to come. He is the eternal God who was from eternity past and will be to eternity future. And it's his love that he gives. He loved us in eternity past. There was never a time that God did not love you. Never. Because in eternity past, God who knows all things, he knew about you. Even before you were born, he loved you. Is it possible to love your child before your child is born? Absolutely it is. There was never a time. So the, this love that God has comes from eternity past. And I will tell you, there will never be a time in eternity future when God will stop loving you. God loves you no matter what we do. That, now, he'll discipline, and sometimes he'll punish, and sometimes he'll, and he will judge, but God will always love. You say, but what if I do something really bad? Will, will God stop loving me? Now, let me tell you, Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should, but Jesus loves me when I'm bad, even though it makes him sad. God loves with a perfect kind of love. It is a love which is an agape love. How, who loves? God loves. How does he love? He loves with agape. For God so loved. And the word there is agape, and if you've heard preachers preach at all about love, you know what I'm about to tell you. There's three kinds of love in the Greek language. There's eros, phileo, and agape. Eros is where we get our word erotic from. It means to love that, that seeks its own, love that takes. There's phileo, which is a friendship kind of love, a brotherly love. A give and take kind of love. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. And then you have agape. And agape is that perfect love. It's the God kind of love. The God that the, the kind of love that does not seek its own, the kind of love that, that seeks only to give. That's the perfect kind of love that God has. Not not eros, which is take, not phileo give and take, but agape, which is always give. That's the heart of God. So who loves? God loves, the eternal God loves us. And how does he love? He loves us with a perfect, eternal love. Well, what's the object of his love? This incredible love that God has from eternity past and will last into eternity future, the perfect love, and the object of his love is us. For God so loved the, the world. The Greek word there is cosmos. We get our word cosmetics from it. It means to put things in order, right? Uh, this world is not in order. And it's not the disorder of this world that God loves. Look, God doesn't, it's not, he's not saying that God loves nature. Be very careful about that. There's a, a cult of, of worshiping Mother Earth out there around us these days. We don't want to worship, we want to be good stewards of the earth. We don't worship the earth. It's not the nature that God's in love with. 
And it's not the world system that God's in love with. When he talks about the world, he's talking about people. In fact, you look at the very next verse, verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Well, who is it that God saves? He saves people. People, that's who he's loving. So what he's saying is, God, this God has this incredible love from eternity past to eternity future, and he loves you and me. And then he says, again in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You remember that he's got this illustration of the snake-bit people. Do you know we are a snake-bit people? Ever since that snake curled around that tree in the Garden of Eden and deceived Eve and Adam took of that fruit, we have been a snake-bit people and we are filled with poison. I'm telling you, there's poison in our lives, the poison of an old sin nature. There's the, the poison of pornography and flirtation, and the poison of, of, uh, of gossip and the poison of envy and the poison of, of pride and the pri poison of jealousy. And you name it, we are filled with this poison. We've been snake bit. But I'm going to tell you, God loves a snake bit world. He loves us anyway. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, he talks about the God who, he says, who loved me and gave himself for me. What a God who loves us anyway. I'm so glad that Jesus loves me. When I was a, a young, we used to sing as a children's song, this song that it was really written as a hymn by P.P. Uh, P. Bliss, Philip P. Bliss, over 100 years ago. But it goes like this. It says, I am so glad uh, that our Father in heaven tells of, the, of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see, but the greatest of all is that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. All the love of Jesus. So who loves us? God does. How does he love us? With that perfect love. What's the object of his love? Well, it's the world. It's you and me. And how does he express that love? He expresses it through sacrifice. Just as a, as a parent who loves their child, what it was sacrificed for their children. Imagine a, a parent who has ten children. Well, say they don't divide their love amongst ten children. It's, their love is multiplied by ten, Right? When you think about God and his love for his children, for, the, for his creation, let me put it that way. He loves the world. He loves all the people of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight, right? God loves the peoples of the world. Do you know how many people are on this earth today? That's right, it's, it's, going, it's upwards towards 8 billion people, 7.594, I think was the latest, at least that's what Google says is on the earth, their estimate. So about 7.6 billion people on the earth. Can you imagine multiplying the love of God times 7.6 billion people? And yet he says he loves every one of them. Now add that to all the billions who've ever lived and, and all who ever will live. Add that all up and we begin to catch a glimpse of the incredible love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved the world. And he, he sends his own son to sac as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. He sends his own son, who is perfect, who has no sin of his own, to die upon the cross to pay the penalty for us. Now you think about this. You say, well, he loves the whole world, but he loves each one of us. I like the way Augustine put it. Augustine said, God loves every one of us if, if, as if we were the only one of us. What parent who, who wouldn't sacrifice and, and give their own life for their child to save the life of their child? And that's what we find here. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 1 John 4, 9, I just want to read this to you. 1 John 4, 9 says, And this was manifested, the love of God toward us. This is how he shows us his love. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation, the, the thing that, that makes it right, the thing that fixes it. Jesus is what does that. And then he says in verse 14 of 1 John chapter 4, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. God sent his only begotten Son. Imagine going to a prison and you're... Uh, you're visiting with folks, maybe you're part of a Christian ministry and you're at the prison and you're visiting and you, you see this person, this person just grabs your heart and you think, oh, I wish this person didn't have to be in prison anymore. And you go, imagine going home and telling your child, hey, leave all your stuff behind, I'm about to send you to a new place. And you send your child to that prison to take the place of that prisoner so the prisoner can go home and your child has to serve out the sentence. Can you imagine that? 
Yet that's what Jesus did for us. God the Father sent Jesus to be our substitute. You remember when Abraham offered Isaac as a, as a sacrifice on the mountains of Moriah. And just as he was about to offer Isaac, the angel stops him and says, do, do, do him no harm. And there in the bushes, there was that ram caught in the thicket to be a substitute. But when God the Father offered his son Jesus, there was no substitute. Jesus was the substitute. Jesus is our substitute, and he had to die upon that cross. In Romans 8, 32, it says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And what did he, what did he deliver him up for? What did he give him up to? Well, the Bible tells us he gave him up to scourging. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, the prophecy says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, from the scourging, the beating that he endured even the night before he was crucified. In Psalm 129.3, it says, The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. Uh, the way they, they would take that, that flagrum, that, that whip with, uh, with leather strips, come one handle and some say probably the cat of nine tails, which the Romans used with nine different strips. And Sometimes they would tie into that uh, pebbles or, or stones or glass or beads. And what they would do is they would take that and they would, rip, they would hit it across the back and it would wrap around the rib cage and they would pull it. And so just like plowing a field, it would plow furrows in the back and just, stretch, just rip holes in the skin and tear the skin off of the body. Jesus endured. He gave his son, God gave his son up. To, and Jesus endured and, and willingly accepted the scourging. But not only the scourging, also the cross. Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, God shows his love to us while we're still sinners, Christ died for us dying in our place. When he died, when, hey, we'll, we'll remember with the, with the juice this morning, the blood of Jesus. Do you realize with, with every drip of the blood of Jesus that, that fell from his body, beginning with the blood that was dripping from his forehead there in the Garden of Gethsemane to the, to the blood that poured from his side, the blood dripping off his body with every drip, 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 what he was saying is, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. It was his love being poured out for us, giving his life blood for us whom God set forth to be a propitiation Romans 3.25 says through his blood it's the propitiation the thing that makes it right that fixes our sin problem it was through the blood of Jesus so that whosoever think of the dimensions of God's love that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life it's a personal love whoever means you or me as individuals Anyone, anywhere, anytime, if they will put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, can be saved and will be saved. God loved and gave. We believe and receive. You think of the love of God to do this for us. I, it's like the little girl who, who asked her mama, she said, Mama, what's in your heart? And her mama said, Well, here, climb up my lap and I'll show you. You, you climb up here on my lap and you look in my eyes and you tell me what you see. A little girl got, climbed up on her lap and looked in her eyes, and she, she, she looked and she said, Mama, there's a little girl in there, and that little girl is me. Can I tell you, you are the apple of God's eye, the Bible says. When you look into the heart of God, you find that you and I are there. So that whosoever believes, any, God loves everyone, He's, whoever believes can be saved. You know that word whosoever occurs 1,200 times in the Greek New Testament? I think God's trying to tell us something. In Hebrews 2, 9, it says, Christ has tasted death for every man. Jesus died for every person. 1 Timothy 2, 6 says, He is the ransom for all. 1 John 2, 1, he says, my, Now listen to this, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, has sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's what, the one that's our advocate that makes us right. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now listen, this maybe explains it a little better. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 talks about lost people, and not just people who are lost and apart from Christ. They are they're preaching damnable heresy, and they are destined for punishment. But watch this. 2 Peter 2, 1 says, There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Did you catch that? They were bought with a price. They were paid for he bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. These are people who are preaching damnable heresies who are going to end up in hell for eternity and yet Jesus paid the price for them as well. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15 says he's died for all. 2 Peter 3, 9, he's not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. Again, 1 Timothy 2, 4, he's willing that all men be saved. So whosoever will may be saved. This idea that you can't be saved because you've been too bad, oh no. Oh no. Look, those disciples... That Nicodemus, after he's buried the body of Jesus and later he, he finds Jesus risen from the dead, Nicodemus and those apostles could have gone to the very men who shaped that crown of thorns and, and, and drove it into Jesus' scalp and they could say, you too can be saved, you're whosoever. He, he, they could have gone to the, to the soldiers who, who drove the nails into Jesus' hands and feet, to the soldier who put the spear in his side and they could have said, you too can be saved. He, he could have gone to the uh, to the, the the religious leaders and the scribes and the, the very ones who, who sought Jesus' death, and even they could be saved. And many of them, we find out, were if they put their faith in Jesus. Whosoever will may be saved. Now, let me help you with it. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 10 says this. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. He's the Savior of all men, particularly, especially those who believe. He's the Savior of all men in the sense that He is potentially the Savior of all men because He has paid the price. But He is specifically the Savior of those who believe. So when you go out and share with somebody the good news that Jesus died for God so loved the world, you can, you can be confident, you can tell that, but you can be saved. But it's only effective to those who will believe by faith. Now you can debate where the faith comes from and how God puts that faith there, but I'm telling you, if you will put your faith in Jesus Christ, whosoever will may be saved. Whoever believes on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Who loves us? God, the, the eternal God, the one who was and is and is to come. He's the one who loves us. How does he love us? With this incredible, eternal, agape love. What's the object of his love? The world, you and me. How does he express his love? He expressed it, expressed it through a sacrifice that can be expect, ex accepted and received, maybe I should say, by us. And what is the result of it? Eternal life. Eternal life. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're all born at least once. We're born physically once. But the person who's born twice, who's born physically, and who is spiritually born again, who's regenerated, who's, who's, who's allowed Jesus to change, transform their heart from the inside out, they're born twice, and they only die once, physically, and then we live forever with Jesus. But to the person who's only born once, they're only born physically, they never have that spiritual rebirth, they'll die twice because they're going to die physically, the Bible says they also will die spiritually. You see, there's never going to be a time when you cease to exist. We're eternal beings. We're made in the image of God. We'll be here forever. One place or the other, we'll either be in heaven or we'll be in hell. Jesus tells Nicodemus, look, I love you so much. I have come. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, just saying believes in me, should never perish, but shall have everlasting life. To, to reject that kind of love, I can't imagine. God loves you and made the ultimate sacrifice so that you would not have to spend eternity in hell, so that you could spend eternity in heaven with Jesus, with your Savior, with our Father in heaven. To have that eternal relationship restored through the work of Jesus Christ. After our time of decision, we're going to observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper and we'll reflect on what Jesus has done for us. But I want you, even before we come to that point, to just stop and begin to think of the great love that God, the love that this represents. That He would willingly come and lay down His own life. But, for the very people who were killing him, that he would literally pay the price for the very people who would preach damnable heresy and seek to, to, to lead people astray for him. And yet Jesus loved them too and could say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, the love of God. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes and just for a moment. But I'm going to ask you to think in your own heart and mind. Has there been a time in your life 
when you have been born again, as we've talked about this morning, spiritually regenerated. Not just that you've been reformed, not that you've had it re revelation and reformation, but genuine regeneration. There's been a heart change. That God's changed your, your heart. That doesn't mean that you're perfect from then on, but it means you're, God changes your want-tos. He changes your desires. You, even though we, sometimes we do the things we don't want to do and don't do the things we want to do, Paul struggled with that, but, but there's a new man on the inside that God's changed our hearts. He's changed our desires. If that's never happened in your heart, it's what you need. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Would you in your heart just say, yes, Lord, I believe. And I trust you. I trust what you did on the cross. And, and that, I'm a sinner. I can't do it. Just like Nicodemus, I can't be good enough. I can't keep enough laws. I can't. I need Jesus you will turn to him in faith and trust him with your life the Bible is so clear you're part of the whosoever whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life just in your own words in your own heart just tell God you're trusting him and ask him to make you know ask him to make, him, make you his child he'll do it and tell him thank you because he promises to do it 